So hello again, everyone. We are uh, now moving to our interactive open session, and uh, we will. Uh, we have just started a webinar focusing on ransomware prevention in the global postal sector. And uh, we have invited an amazing panel of experts uh, in the field of cybersecurity and threat intelligence to discuss and engage uh, with us uh, on uh, this topic. This is quite uh, very relevant uh, because the ransomware threat uh, is uh, one threat that is increasingly affecting also our sectors, not only uh, private people, but also the business uh, everywhere in the, in the world is affected by this uh, ransomware. Therefore, it is very important for us to better understand uh, our threat, the threat we are facing, and how we could possibly counter it. So let me give the floor to the IP uh, to introduce this uh, agenda item and to moderate the panel discussion. So, Tracy, you have now the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and welcome to everyone who's joining us from wherever you are in the world. Um, in Switzerland, it's morning time, so good morning for those in Switzerland and Europe, and for the rest of the world, good day, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us for today's ransomware prevention in the global postal sector um, session. As um, our Chair said, we do have an exciting and very intense session planned for you today. Um, we have several experts lined up um, that you can see on the screen. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves at the appropriate time, um, but just let you know who they are. We have, I'm going to call in order of what I'm seeing on my screen, John Brown from Team Cymru, Matt Hull from the NCC Group, George Abraham from the Global Anti-Scam Alliance and Scam Advisor, Peter Weglevin from Zero Networks, and last but not least, because he's actually with me, literally here today, uh, Misha Obrecht from DreamLab Technologies. Welcome all. Um, so they will introduce themselves shortly in our introductory session. But before we begin, I'm going to ask um, my director of the UPU Postal Technology Center, Lati Matata, to give us sort of a, a few minutes set the context, set the stage about what, why we're here today and what we're doing here today. So Lati, over to you. Thank you very much, Tracy. So as Tracy introduced, my name is Lati Matata. I'm the director of the Postal Technology Center. Um, and I just want to speak a little bit about what is the postal sector within the UPU. So maybe to the panelists who might not be familiar with the UPU, uh, we are an intergovernmental organization, and our job is sort of to oversee uh, the postal sector, the public postal sector, and we are a country driven uh, member body. So, uh, thinking about the public postal sector, uh, the first, let's say, most of the time you start thinking of the very, very old processes very paper-based, which is mostly true up to a point. But actually from uh, about 1999, uh, we became highly, highly digital. Um, why I say this is you, of course, have uh, the experience of going to your normal post office, not the private sectors, so the traditional one. Uh, you hand them over a parcel, you get a barcode, and they tell you go to a website and follow where it's going anywhere in the world. On that point of anywhere in the world, uh, the UPU's network is massive. So if you look at the introductory text uh, about the UPU, we say we are a network of networks covering 192 territories, uh, composed of about 200 plus designated postal operators, and with uh, postal access points of around 700,000 postal access points. So basically, you walk into your local post office, you hand over a parcel, you're given a barcode, and it magically appears somewhere in the world to the person that you addressed it to. Now, in between that, there is a lot of digital processes that happen other than moving the, the piece of, of mail. 
So, as I mentioned, back in 1999, we were focused on track and trace. A lot of messages were sent between the postal operators and exposed to you as a customer. Then we started using this data for accounting processes, and that's from the mid-2000s. An interesting trend now is to use this same data-driven processes for what we call customs clearance processes. Now, what that means is two things. The first thing is, in these custom-driven processes, personal identifiable information is digitalized and sent over our networks. That's the first important thing. The second important thing is now our operational, our physical operational processes are actually driven by decisions of the availability of the data and the quality of the data. So no longer is digital processes, let's say, a side part of our physical operations, but actually they are the deciders of the physical operation. So now this has entered a new critical phase for us. And for that reason, uh, I would say dot post, its focus on cybersecurity awareness, its focus on cybersecurity protection is critical to us. So in short, we are very, very pleased for you to uh, make yourselves available to speak to all of us. We are very, very pleased that we can listen to you panelists and learn from you about how we as the postal sector can protect ourselves from ransomware attacks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lati. And that was an extremely, I think, very useful and I'm sure helpful introduction to what we, why we are here today and what we are dealing with. Um, I am absolutely positive the discussion amongst our panelists and attendees will zero in on the issues that the postal sector faces. But as we start, we will zero out, or zoom out, I should say, um, for a bit. And we will begin our discussion um, focused at the, I guess, at the highest level. To do that, I would, I would like to ask um, George Abraham, Professor George Abraham, from the Global Anti-Scam Alliance and from Scam Advisor to give us an introduction um, to himself, first of all, as well as to um, the concept of scams and online scams. And George will also provide the link between scams and ransomware. So he's going to take sort of a, a, a helicopter view and we're going to zoom in from there. So I hope that you uh, appreciate this, this approach that we're taking. George, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, just checking, do you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you said, my, my name is George Abraham. I run both the Global Anti-Scam Alliance, which is a non-profit organization where we bring together law enforcement, governments, uh, uh, telecom operators, postal services, consumer authorities, and anybody else who's interested in helping consumers not get scammed online. And I run scamadvisor.com, which is our business to consumer brand, where we have about 5 million consumers every uh, uh, month checking if a website is legit or might be a scam. Um, our mission is, as I said, very simple. We want to help consumers worldwide not get scammed. Um, but maybe taking one step back before I, I go deeper into this, uh, what are scams? Um, scams are a, a, a weird kind of crime. Um, they are the only crime you can actually fall for. And that makes it special, uh, like extortion scams, because it's, um, uh, something where people feel uh, ashamed for, uh, they don't go to the police, um, um, and the, the, the victim itself is, is in some way part of the crime. Um, where scams are a, a difficult area, I mean, where does bad service end and where, does, uh, where do scams start? If you go to Trustpilot or Sitejabber or other review sites, uh, very remarkable, uh, their scores for Apple and ASOS are terrible. So, but we all, I think, agree that these are not scams. How we define scams, apart from the formal definition, is that there's a huge gap between what's being promised and what's being delivered. Um, and uh, that, uh, when that gap becomes too large, then it becomes a scam. So it's not black and white. It is a, there's a twilight zone. 
what we nowadays see is that, I mean, what started with malware, went to online phishing, now online scams. I mean, they're all related, uh, just as extortion scams and extortion online are very related to online scams. But we do see that especially consumers are hit more and more by scams, which are not necessarily malware or, or phishing. Um, there are hundreds of different definitions of scams and, and also types. And going from products not being delivered to investment scams to, of course, ransomware and extortion scams, sometimes real and sometimes uh, fake. And yes, of course, um, sometimes the victim could have known better. I mean, if you buy a verified PayPal account or you try to buy a weapon online or a driver's license or you want somebody to write your thesis for you, it might not be a surprise that you do not get the service or product delivered and you get scammed. Um, you will not very likely go to the police to complain about it. Um, some scams are too incredible to believe, but they do work. Um, recently, there was a Japanese lady who paid an astronaut 35,000 euros. Um, the scammer claimed to be an astronaut uh, stuck in space and he needed money to return to Earth. Um, and of course, he also promised to, to, uh, promised to marry her. Um, so maybe taking one step back, how big are online scams at the moment? Um, what we do every year is we res research 48 different countries and try to determine how much money is being lost, how many people are being scammed, and what are governments and organizations actually doing to protect their consumers uh, better. Um, and we, no surprise, we see a, a very sharp rise. Last year, we estimated about 55 billion euros being lost in scams, reported by over 300 million people. However, uh, uh, as a result, we see that already online scams are either the first most or second most reported crime in most countries. In the UK, 41% of all crime now reported to law enforcement is related to online fraud. In Singapore, this figure is even 50%. So this is only the tip of the iceberg uh, because uh, we see that as a global average, only 7% of all scams and extortions are actually reported uh, to law enforcement by consumers. Zooming in on, on business to business scams, because this seminar is of course about business to business scams and especially extortion. Um, we see that companies often focus on what we call the hardcore cybercrime, the hacking, the DDoS attacks. Um, but they often leave the door open uh, 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 when they regard their own employees and users. We see a lot of B2B scams. We see a lot of comprised e uh, employees and of course phishing. And I think there should be much more attention to the entire uh, threat landscape and not only to, to hacking and DDoS attacks. Um, some B2B scams are obvious and rather innocent. I mean, uh, they still exist where you can pay uh, a huge amount of money to get your face on a non-existing uh, magazine or a magazine which might be exist, but nobody reads. Um, we also see that more and more uh, scams are coming up around uh, uh, fake orders. Uh, this uh, website was actually set up by a scammer to convince a office supplier uh, uh, to uh, deliver office equipment the office equipment was immediately resold on, 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 on the marketplaces and um, well, the uh, office equipment seller was thinking that he was doing business with this company, uh, actually the address was fake. The company exists, is registered, but the address where to deliver was fake. Um, we see the same with wholesale, especially on Alibaba. Uh, scammers are trying to attract uh, 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 companies to buy. Uh, not on Alibaba itself, they use it as an advertising platform where you can buy materials, and then they take the conversation online, on fake websites, uh, and hope to get an order, especially for raw materials uh, uh, and uh, intermediate products. Same with airline companies, there are a massive amount of fake transport companies now around. And some of these scams are very professional. We see, for example, a website which really looks very legit, but only after researching, hey, you claim to be 25 years old, but why is your website only two years old? And we didn't get any reply, and we did some further research. We have serious doubts 
about this uh, uh, company. Um, and then, of course, extortion scams. And you have the real ones and the fake ones. And you would be amazed how many companies email us every day with emails that, hey, uh, 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 we're being hacked uh, or uh, we're, our data is encrypted. Well, it's actually not the case. It's just trying to get uh, uh, money. And finally, uh, we see also a lot of recruitment scams, especially targeting cybersecurity professionals within the company with malware. So they get an invite invitation on LinkedIn uh, saying that they have a job offer. They click on the PDFs with the vacancy and actually that includes then the malware. And of course, cybersecurity experts within a company have a huge uh, amount of access to all kinds of systems and are very interesting targets for cyber criminals. What we now see actually is that phishing is the uh, uh, one of the most used methods to get in with ransomware into a company. But there's an interesting development and that's the unknown. We more and more do not know where, uh, how uh, uh, the attacker is getting into the company to compromise uh, uh, the systems. And that might be an interesting part for the debate later on. Where I would like to emphasize uh, or uh, uh, address uh, especially attention towards is the risk of your own employees. Your own employees are both consumer and employee. And we do see that more and more companies are being hurt, not intentionally by their employees, but because their employees are being scammed. And as a result, they bring in malware. They become a liability because they have invested in an investment scam, lost all their money, and then become uh, a potential yeah, liability to the company. We see it also with Roman scams, and especially with sextortion, that the goal is not to get money from the employee. The goal is to get data or access to the company. So we do think it's very important that you not only protect your own systems, but especially your employees, not only from malware, not only from phishing, but also from other scams targeting your employees. Um, I'm running out of time, but I really would like to quickly round up with what we can do together. So what we do see is that scammers are winning at the moment. The market is growing very quickly and the chances of getting caught are very, very slim. According to the World Economic Forum, at the moment, only 0.05% of all cyber crimes are being prosecuted. So how can we turn the tide? Often we say awareness, 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 but what we actually saw in recent studies is that awareness is not resulting in a decrease of victimization. Why? Because the, the, the scam victim has received awareness training, has become more, how do you say, confident on, online, and people as a result are becoming overconfident and are still being scammed or uh, being misused to, for, by cyber, cyber criminals. Um, what can we do together? I think uh, the, the role of the Global anti scam Alliance and, and Scam Advisor is to bring together as many stakeholders as possible to share knowledge around scams in our working groups and at our summits, but also to really share data. Um, so there are three things we can do together. One is please uh, uh, feel free to use our data. We offer API access, we offer our data feed to protect your employees and your users. And please also share domain names which are clearly misusing your brand or our scams with us. We are ha very happy to share it with all our data users, which are antivirus companies, uh, security companies, search engines and social media, to warn consumers that this website is a scam. And finally, we offer a, a tool which might help also your users and consumers. It's called Check My Link. It's a white label version of Scam Advisor, which is now live in 10 countries. Uh, no, I should say 15 countries where people can go to a website which can be in your own look and feel. People can check if a website is legit or a possible scam and draw their own conclusions. And with that, I would like to conclude and give back the floor to the chairman. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, George. Appreciate that. And um, I think this was an excellent introduction to the overall topic of scams and how um, we, within the postal sector, um, can potentially be affected by the, the overall scourge of scams, online scams, and potentially this is where uh, malware, as you indicated, can um, create incursions into our networks. 
I think that's very important because as we go through this discussion, it's important to understand that while we discuss ransomware prevention, it is not strictly a technical topic, but it really is an issue of how, how does it get into our networks, our environments. And increasingly, we have found, it's been found that it's no longer using things like RDP. It, it's primarily through um, methods that you mentioned, scams and phishing and so on. Um, George, if, I, if you don't mind, you can um, stop sharing your screen. Oh. My and um, I can now um, ask colleagues, and of course, I do appreciate if you could keep to the original time of five to seven minutes per, um, per, per presenter. Um, we're going to move on to something focused on ransomware specifically now with an introduction to an overview of the topic of ransomware. For this, I'm going to invite Matt Hull who is the Global Head of Cyber Threat Intelligence at the NCC Group, to introduce himself and to provide us with some insight into this, what exactly is ransomware, and, um, and, and some figures that he, that he may have to share with us. Matt, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just checking you can hear me and you can see my screen? Yes, we can hear you and we can see uh, your so screen. Thank you very much. Uh, intro is partly done. So my name is Matt Hull. I'm the Global Head of Cyber Threat Intelligence at NCC Group. NCC Group are a global cybersecurity company and we provide services across um, multiple sectors and multiple regions, focusing on penetration testing, traditional assurance, um, incident response and managed detection capabilities as well, as well as cyber threat intelligence. So just for, for my slot this morning, um, I'm just going to be giving you a bit of an overview about what ransomware is. And it's one of those topics, isn't it, that is on everybody's lips. Um, whether you are working in um, technical um, environments, whether you're defending against um, these types of threats, or whether you're just reading the newspaper, there is something in the news every single day about a new ransomware incident. Um, and it's affecting everyone. It's affecting every organization around the globe. It's affecting all types of organizations, no matter which sector or region you operate in. Uh, and more specifically for the focus of, of today's discussion, it is impacting organisations that work within within postal services as well. But what is ransomware and where does it come from? So it's, believe it or not, it's been around for quite some time. So back in the, the late 80s, we saw the first uh, use of ransomware. Uh, albeit it wasn't online, it was actually deployed using floppy disks, um, but it was used anyway. Uh, and it presented a demand on, on someone's screen. So what ransomware has historically done, as typically focused on, is encrypting data. So denying access of the user to their data. Uh, and then a demand is made. So in, as per tra uh, traditional um, uh, ransom type uh, activity. So denying that access, demanding a payment to recover access to that data. Uh, and over the years, the ransomware capabilities have improved. They've increased uh, in terms of their sophistication. In the, the early noughties, up to, to sort of 2010, there was a focus on mass targeting of organizations using online delivered ransomware. So uh, malicious software that was essentially deployed through phishing links. So again, going back to that concept of using social engineering, but also contained within uh, files within within emails as well so being delivered through what looks like a legitimate email or a legitimate file uh, and targeting multiple organizations as as the capabilities increased uh, and uh, as as the the attacks became more sophisticated um different types of ransomware were introduced so focusing on locking down entire environments as opposed to purely focusing on individual data sets and of course with the with the um the introduction of cryptocurrencies, this became a lot easier for organized criminal groups to actually deliver um, their ransomware um, capability, but also um, to make demands and make demands using crypto, which of course makes it much harder to track down where that money is going and who was responsible for those attacks. As attacks evolved further, we saw big, big impacting um, attacks such as the WannaCry um, incident back in 2017. I guess that's the one that's on everyone's lips as the big ransomware incident um, in, in our sort of living memory anyway. Um, and that affected organizations around the globe because that became a, a wormable piece of malware. So it was actually able to spread through, uh, through an organization's environment 
and that took advantage of a very very widely um, uh, prolific uh, vulnerability within within organizations through a Microsoft vulnerability as I guess things have moved on we've moved into a, a period now where ransomware is kind of at the pinnacle of its uh, of its use and its reach um, the concept of big game hunting, so less a case of targeting everyone and anyone, but actually zooming in on those organisations that are more likely to pay um, big ransomware demands. We've seen the evolution from purely encryption of data to the actual exfiltration of data as well through this process called double extortion. So ransomware operators are now encrypting data but also stealing it. So there's the initial demand to get access back to their data that's been encrypted, but also it's now being leaked and it's being made publicly available on so-called leak sites. And that of course has a massive impact for organizations when it comes to regulatory fines. So personally identifiable information has been breached, has been leaked, um, but also reputational damage as well. So um, customers of organizations are having their personal information potentially leaked on, onto the internet. And what makes it even more prevalent at the minute as well is that ransomware is, is very much as a service. So anybody can through a dark web forum or marketplace, access ransomware capabilities and deploy your own attacks relatively cheaply and at scale as well. In terms of um, just looking at some of the numbers, because we, we track this stuff within my team at NCC Group, um, and what we can see here is the number of double extortion victims over the last three years. Um, while everything is a little bit up and down between 2021 and 2022, what we actually saw was a decrease in ransomware double extortion victims last year by about 5%. Um, but scary reading for this year so far, um, we can see that the numbers are well off the scale and they're, they're, they're far higher than what we've seen in, in recent years. One of the main reasons for that big jump in March is actually there's a, a ransomware operator called CLOP um, and they have taken advantage of a widely um, used piece of software that had a vulnerability within it and that has resulted in mass exploitation there through through that mechanism through the go anywhere um, exploit in terms of targeted sectors that we saw this is 2022's data so heavy focus on in the industrial sector and what this includes is things like manufacturing processing um, but also construction and those sorts of industries as well um, consumer cyclicals, this is um, high-end retail and hospitality type stuff. Uh, technology, um, sort of does what it says on the tin, but then also healthcare and, and basic materials and academia and education. Postal, in the terms of uh, what this is looking at, sits within the industrial sector because actually a lot of that processing of information sits within those sorts of manufacturing and um, IoT type environments. So that's a, a bit of a whistle-stop tour on where ransomware has come from and where it's heading to. Uh, and obviously happy to take some questions uh, a little bit later on. But if you do want to get any more information about these threats, then we publish this data for free through something called our Threat Pulse. Uh, I've got a link there for you. So if anyone does want to keep tabs on, on these sorts of statistics as they develop over time, then they're available through, through that publication. So thank you very much. Looking forward to speaking to everyone later if you've got any questions. Thank you very much, Matt. Those were, I have to say, um, very startling figures that you presented. But um, on a more positive note, I, I do appreciate the, the, the very clear explanation of what ransomware is um, and the historical overview, which I think not many people be aware of, um, that it started in the 80s. I thought that I, I myself... Um, um, challenged by that that feat of history. That's very interesting. Um, so as, as Matt said, um, we will be discussing this further and Matt will be available in the, the discussion that we have just after these introductory pres presentations. So um, please feel free to pose your questions in the Q&A box um, as you're seeing some questions going in there and we will try and answer as we see fit and maybe our panelists can also answer if any questions come to them in the Q&A box, um, the chat we can use for comments as far as possible. Um, next up, we do have um, sort of a deeper dive into this ransomware discussion, and we are asking um, our colleague Misha Obrecht from Dream Lab Technologies to take, a, take us into this landscape, this ransomware threat landscape, and to help us understand exactly what we are talking about in terms of what are we facing, 
um, and, and what is the real nature of this threat? Misha, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. And thank you for having me. You should be able to see my screen. Is that the case? Yep. Okay. Then let's full screen this. All right. My name is, my name is Misha. I'm a consultant, uh, tester, and researcher for DreamLab. I like uh, understanding things and researching them and then talking about them. Today we are talking about the ransomware threat landscape. Um, <clears throat> we already heard uh, some words about what ransomware actually is, and I'd just like to point out two ways in how ransomware operators are getting more and more creative these days. We heard about classical ransomware, which is just encrypting data and then double extortion, so exfiltrating and then demanding ransom for not publishing data. It goes further. There is a triple extortion uh, tactic um, on the rise, which means that operators or criminals start to exploit relationships between their primary victims and then customers or business relationships of their victims to third parties. And it goes in the other direction as well, which is just simple extortion without encryption. So at some point, the ransomware operator figured, figured out that it's actually not always necessary to encrypt data. Sometimes it's enough to just threaten to publish the data that they stole. So, yeah, criminals are inventive and creative. <clears throat> um, when we want to understand the threat landscape, we should spend a little time about how does ransomware actually get into an organization, and it's more or less this process here. There's always this phase of initial access, so one has to get the foot in the door of an organization, and then uh, it is about uh, looking around, uh, moving laterally inside a network, inside an organization, stealing data, and finally, sometimes at least, encrypting data. Uh, one example for reconnaissance here that we recently saw in the wild is that the criminals actually looked for insurance policies in mailboxes of, um, of their victims and then adjust their ransom demands to the amount that is covered by the insurance policy. So the, ins the, the initial amount that they demanded very well matched the insurance policy that is, or the insurance money that was covered by the policy. Um, the ransomware threat landscape is industrializing. Uh, what I mean by that is there is an increasing automation happening. Uh, there are things like Shodan and databases and tools that help criminals automate uh, their activities and there is specialization and division of labor happening. So what we typically, typically see is that there are groups that specialize on in getting initial access uh, to organizations and then brokering this initial access to other groups who specialize on actually installing ransomware, uh, subverting defenses, stealing data and extorting money. Um, Let's talk about initial access for, uh, for a second. We already heard about a lot uh, of how phishing and the use of stolen credentials and actually the human element is a common denominator in the initial access phase. Uh, about 80% of breaches are somehow involved the human element. Um, the remaining 20% are more or less uh, services that are published into the open internet that get uh, compromised and then used as a backdoor. <clears throat> Here are some examples of how this could look like or some more food for thought. Uh, talking about phishing, um, people start using large language models such as GTP to write phishing mails. So that means we are likely going to see uh, an increase in sof sophistication in phishing mails. Uh, another way to gain initial access involving the human element is just to simply buy an employee or buy access to, uh, to an organization. This is an example of a group called Lapsus um, offering a reward for somebody giving them access to, a, to an organization. Here we have an example of an access broker selling access to an organization on a Russian underground forum. And this finally is an example of the Swiss National Sem uh, Center for Cybersecurity reminding uh, critical infrastructure operators to close gapping vulnerabilities in their systems. So this is also a thing. Sometimes systems remain in the open internet for a long, long time without having weaknesses getting fixed. One more uh, thing on this note about exposed systems. Um, I actually I didn't try to look for the uni uni Universal Postal Union, but I stumbled upon it by accident by looking at the data set that we own at uh, DreamLab. I just looked at systems that two years ago had suffered two quite catastrophic uh, vulnerabilities. Um, there are ways to find these. It's easy. And the point here is 
just by looking at the data set and looking for these systems that may be vulnerable, um, the Universal Postal Union came up in the top five organizations in Switzerland that run these kind of systems. Um, I'm not saying these systems are vulnerable right now. I'm saying these are easy to find and potential entry doors, uh, once you know what you're looking for, are very easy to find. It took me about five minutes to, to find uh, these systems here. Moving on to the second part of actually monetizing the, the attack and the, the extortion tactics, um, there was a group named Conti, uh, which was a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian uh, citizens. When the Russian-Ukrainian conflict started, this group dissolved uh, because of uh, issues they had inside their, uh, their organization, and somebody actually leaked a lot of internal information, which was a treasure trove to analyze and understand how these groups work. What we learned is that Ransomware groups, they basically operate like businesses. There, are, there is a um, human resources department, there is a hierarchy, there are different roles like programmers, testers, different specializations who all have their different um, roles in the organization. <clears throat> what happens if you do get compromised? Um, this is, uh, are some results from two reports by Sophos. Um, about half of ransomware victims manage to get their data back from backups, uh, and the other half, uh, of the other half, about a quarter, they pay the ransom, and another quarter of this uh, other half, they s some completely lose their data, and some find some other means to get their data back. Sometimes there are free decryption tools available, but uh, this is actually decreasing this uh, gray slice here. So I wouldn't count on the, a free tool being available to decrypt your data. So can you recover the, your data? It depends. Um, if you have regular offline backups, then you should be fine. Sometimes there are decryption tools. If you pay, there is no guarantee that you will actually get your data back. Also in the same report, it states that only about 65% of victims who do pay actually get their data back. So that's something to keep in mind. One final um, word, this is an extrapolation to the year 2032. Um, everybody who knows their statistics knows that you shouldn't trust extrapolations so far in the future, but even if only 10% of this is true, we are looking at a massive increase in ransomware damages uh, worldwide in the next 10 years. And with that, uh, back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Misha. That was, um, I think that was, very, again, very startling information presented there. Um, I was particularly intrigued by that um, slide you showed uh, regarding the, the, the new ways that um, this, is, this is being perpetrated. And um, obviously, I think there's going to be a um, potential um, risk for this increasing, as you say, exponentially over the next several years. I mean, to be very, very wary and very careful about. Um, so with that in mind, um, we've given some very, very, you know, this sort of bad news or some, some scary figures, um, some data. But maybe my colleague John, John Brown from Team Cymru, would be able to give us some positive information as to how we can prevent ransomware with some best practices. Um, so John, maybe I could hand over to you um, with your experience to, to introduce yourself and to let us uh, have a sense of how we can prevent ransomware. Um, go ahead, John, thank you. Great, can everybody see my uh, slides okay and hear me? Yes, we can. Great, awesome. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time zone you happen to be in. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, having us today and putting on this uh, important conference. Um, I just have a few slides to discuss uh, some things about uh, ransomware uh, prevention and some best practices of things that organizations should uh, be doing. Um, there's a couple slides I'll just pop through very quickly here. These are non-classified uh, slides. so. In the security world, we call that traffic light protocol, so TLP clear, feel free to make use of these. Uh, briefly about me, uh, I am a CISSP. I'm also a uh, commercial multi-engine uh, airplane pilot. I've been doing internet things for 35 plus years, um, et cetera. I won't belabor all of that. Uh, but there's some interesting crossovers between 
commercial aviation and good uh, practices in the cybersecurity world, which I'll hint at a little bit in, uh, in our presentation. I work for Team Cymru as a security uh, evangelist. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about some things that we might have uh, that could help uh, down the road, but uh, I don't really want to be in a sales presentation. So uh, there's a slide about that. But let's uh, go into more best practices. In, in my mind, it's not really about if you're going to get ransomware. It's really more about when you're going to get hit with a ransomware. As, as our colleagues before have uh, presented and shown, uh, ransomware is on the rise. It's becoming more automated, more industrialized. It's there, um, the tools to find uh, vulnerability and paths into an organization are getting easier. Um, and there are a lot of organizations and a lot of verticals out there where uh, the, they're low hanging fruit. Those are organizations that haven't thought so much about that they're going to be a ransomware victim. I mean, who wants to ransomware? I mean, I don't wanna be overly simplistic here, but stamps on, on a postcard. But really, there's a huge infrastructure behind the ability to, to, to run our global postal environment. And that's real money and that's real commerce. And there is a uh, very large target there that says that uh, there's a potential for payout. The thing we have to keep in mind about the threat actors out there is the risk reward factor is very much in their favor, right? the risk of getting caught is very low. The reward is very high. And so we have to we have to keep that in balance. So it's not a matter of if, but when. And so there are some things that we need to do organizationally that, that are critical for that. We need to have offline backups. And I don't mean just that you've backed up your data and put it on a different drive stored network attached storage unit that's still connected to the network, right? I'm talking about physically putting a backup that literally goes off site, locked up in a different location, is not connected to your network. You need to have that physical air gap separation. You need to test your backups. You need to make sure that, that you, your backups actually do work. Uh, I've been doing this thing long enough that I can remember back in the days when we used to do tape backups. And a person would put a tape drive in, in to a tape drive, and they'd back up to it every day. And then Months later, they would want to try to restore their backup, but they couldn't because the actual tape, magnetic material on the tape had worn down because they never actually physically changed the tape. So you need to test your backups. You really want to make sure you have golden copies of, of your installs, right? So when you are in the middle of a situation, you want to have a known set of CDs, thumb drive, whatever the install mechanism is for your operating system and applications that are critical, you have a known set that works, that's up to date and is not physically connected to the network and cannot be infected, right? So you wanna know that you can quickly restore those servers from a low level perspective, from bare metal back up. And speaking of backing up and bare metal, we have supply chain issues still. If your threat actor has done enough damage to your infrastructure, you may not want to use the same server that was attacked. And maybe you can't use the same server because it's now being involved in a criminal investigation or some other investigation because it's evidence. It's where, what's going on. So that server can't come back up. So you need to have a separate piece of equipment to be able to put back into play. So having a cold spare, something online, uh, something in your inventory that allows you to bring those servers physically back online and uh, um, rebuild the infrastructure. I remember many years ago, banks used to actually go to cold spare sites where they would have another IBM 360 or, or similar sitting over in a cold storage location. And that company would provide the ability to allow the bank to disaster recover, fail over to that cold storage site and start bringing up their systems if their main mainframe had failed. So you might want to look at that practice uh, in in the modern world today. But most important, um, have a written updated plan that's been tested. Have a plan A, 
and then have a plan B. As a, as a commercial pilot, we always have a plan B. We always know where we're going to divert to if there's a weather or a mechanical failure. We're constantly updating that as we as our trip progresses. And that's something we need to do in the uh, prevention of ransomware and how to help mitigate. Let's look at some vectors of how people get uh, infected, if you will. You need to do a regular scanning of your network assets. You need to know what your network assets are. You need to know what laptops and desktops. Also, more importantly, you, nowadays, you need to know what Internet of Things or IoT devices are connected to your network. Keep in mind that that small card reader that is doing your credit card processing, there's only so much hardware, there's only so much money they're gonna spend building that device. So they're not spending a lot of money building super strong security into it. And does that device that's now connected to an ethernet jack, does that device have a vulnerability in it that could be compromised that now could be leveraged because your internal IT policies allow uh, traffic from an internal address. So could that scanner, could that device be something that is used to, uh, to attack your network? I think that it can. There's certainly some interesting uh, case studies out there that show that very large organizations have been hit because something on the inside was compromised in a way that people didn't think about. So maintain an inventory. Basically, if it connects to the network, scan it. Inventory it. Know what version of software are you running on it. Know what the MAC addresses are of that device. Patch and test your devices regularly, right? Filter traffic that has no business to being on your network. Filter out ports 137 through 139, port 445. Make sure RDP is not available from the public internet and probably not even available from inside the network. Is there a reason that you needed to use remote desktop? Um, you need to have a tested plan A and a tested plan B. You need to train staff, but we have to be careful about training staff because if you overtrain, you desensitize that staff. They become sort of, yeah, yeah, we've heard this before. It's yet another internal phishing attack. I'll click on it anyway. I'll get my little point that says I went through the training, but wait a minute, that wasn't actually a training fish. That was a real fish. So make sure that you balance your training and that you don't desensitize the, uh, your staff. Train your staff to look for key indicators. Train staff to not react to an urgent message, but to have them stop, evaluate, think, confirm what they think it is, and then take an action, right? I mean, we see business email compromises where somebody will pretend to be the CEO and send an email that says, hey, I'm on site, I'm trying to do this deal, I really urgently need you to wire $250,000 to me so we can get this really great deal done and so forth. I, I need you to move fast, come on, let's go, go, go. And people have a tendency to not stop and think, they go, that looks like the CEO's email, he has enough information, and yeah, I need to get this done because I've got a million other things I gotta do comes back to the point that one of our other presenters made, which is cyber crime today is a business. They treat it as a business, right? They get up in the morning, they're figuring out what their revenue is and what their losses are. All of those things, just like we do. The difference is what they are doing is harmful and what we're doing is not harmful. So they are going to figure out how to get information to pretend to be that CEO, that vice president of sales or whomever, to cause you to act or react quickly. So stop, evaluate, think, confirm, and then act. Leverage things like DMARC, DNSSEC, to help protect your domain and email systems. Make sure that when somebody receives an email from you, that that is in fact an email and a domain that has validity behind it that is harder to spoof, harder to fake, and folks know what's going on there. Again, you'll hear me say this, have a plan B. Your email and domain reputation is a great way to help prevent and set trust within your community and constituency. 
be alert, right? Look at the threat intelligence. Look at what's happening on your network. Many times a threat actor is going to do a recon of your network and try to figure out vulnerabilities. Maybe they're doing a direct recon of your network or they're using something like Shodan or they're using one of the other tools out there to search and find uh, what's out there and what's vulnerable. So pay attention and be alert to what's going on in your network. Look at what is a normal pattern of life for your network. Monitor your system logs. Use automation when you can to help raise and flag up things that are outside of a pattern of life. When I ran an internet service provider business, every morning I'd get up and look at my network monitoring graphs and I could tell if my network overnight work was weren't running well or not. Just by 10 seconds of looking at the graphs, I could tell a pattern of life was changed or not, and I had a sense of what's happening. Have a plan. You can have all the best technology in the world, but if you don't have a written tested plan, you won't know what to do when ransomware strikes. So let's use an analogy for a second. You're flying across the Atlantic in that Airbus 350, and all of a sudden you have an engine failure. The flight crew pulls out a quick response card. And when they pull that quick response card out, it tells them exactly what to do to deal with that engine failure and as a checklist, right? And the reason we have that checklist is because we humans, when we're under stress, we tunnel vision. Our view of the world gets shorter and shorter depending on stress and we're focused. By having a checklist, we assure that the flight crew knows what steps need to be taken to help solve the problem of that engine failure and thus keep the airplane in the lot up in the air. Well, if that works really well for aviation, why wouldn't we want to do that in running our IT organization? So have an incident response plan. Have a plan that documents what you're going to do. Test your plan. Senior management needs to be involved in this plan, not only in the development of it, but in the sign off of it and the support on executing it, right? Does your plan identify key critical stakeholders? Is it IT? Is legal there from a regulatory perspective, from a contract perspective, from a risk management perspective? Is your legal folks at the table to discuss this plan? What about your customer support? If you've had a ransomware attack and your systems are down, your customers are gonna be calling in. Do you have a plan and does your customer support organization know what to do, what to say? What about sales? What about marketing folks? What is your message that you're gonna put out into social media? Who is the leader of this plan? In many cases, the leader of this plan may not be a chief or senior executive. It may be somebody else who is more actively involved in execution of the plan. But make sure that the person who's executing the plan is also not the person that has to communicate to everybody about the plan, right? Because their job should be executing the plan. Somebody needs to take point. You need to have these people at the table when you're putting together uh, a plan. That's, in a summary, uh, some things that you should look at doing from a... Uh, um, risk management or uh, ransomware mitigation or management prevention is build a plan, understand what in your organization is vulnerable, have an inventory of that vulnerabilities, and make sure you stay on top of the devices and the things and the firmware, et cetera, in your network. And then know what how your network runs, what's going on on your network, what's going on in your business. Folks that want to steal from you are going to be creative. They're going to figure out a way to steal from you if they want to. Our job is to make it more difficult. With that, I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, John. And um, I'd like to hit on a couple of things you said there. But first of all, I um, identify with that backup issue that you mentioned. Um, I remember, I, I, I hope it doesn't belie my age. Um, <laughs> I work, worked in government for some time, actually, in my own country. And um, we did have backup failures on multiple occasions, that same tape drive issue. And all, all hell broke loose when you, you, you have a problem with your backups. So that's a very important point to get that backup procedure right. Don't rely on um, one media um, and have a plan B. I think that's extremely important as well. And I also want to um, 
support your 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 statement on having um, domains, emails, and so on that are um, compliant with with best practice and best practice standards. And as you know, dot post is compliant with the NSSEC, and uh, we also use um, compliance measures um, for our dot post domain um, holders to ensure that their DMARC and um, they're basically the email um, support is compliant with our security policies. So with dot post, I would want to ensure that our members and those who have not yet got a dot post domain um, do reach out to us because I think um, that's one arrow in the in the quiver that you can use to to ensure um, um, that you're you know more resilient in this fight against ransomware. Now we've heard a lot of stories, um, seen a lot of data, um, but there's one person in this this panel who actually um, is going to let us into maybe take a look into an actual ransomware incident and what um, they did to assist that particular um, customer. Um, we have Peter um, from Zero Networks who is going to share with us a, a brief case study on this particular um, victim and um, of course with all confidence um, in place and um, we're probably going to explore that a little further as we go forward in our session today. So Peter, over to you, thank you. Fantastic, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for, uh, for having me. Uh, so my name is Peter and I uh, work for a company called Zero Networks, which I recently joined, somewhat recently. Before that, I uh, worked for Microsoft for about 15 years, always been active in the, the security space. So Zero Networks is a company that specializes in micro segmentation I'll explain a little bit about that uh, further on in this conversation. But like you mentioned, first we're going to talk about a case study. Now, before I go there, um, I think a couple of things have been explained in this uh, in this um, by the previous presenters already. Uh, attackers are winning. One of the reasons that attackers are winning is because networks are open, so it's fairly easy for attackers to move lateral. Um, according to dataprod.net, which is a website anyone can visit. Uh, last year, every 11 seconds, there's been a ransomware attack. The year before, it was 40 seconds. Um, and how do attackers get in? I think we've heard it as well by the previous presenters, either through phishing, malicious websites, or sometimes you have specific uh, services exposed to the internet. Uh, someone, the previous uh, presenter also talked about RDP, whether you should have that at all. At all. Uh, my latest job in Microsoft, I was actually on the RDS team that invented RDP. Uh, so it, it hurt it a little bit, but I'll, I'll manage. So I'm going to share a story about uh, something which is called Update Your Flash Player. So this story goes back to late 2017, and it's around a large financial organization somewhere in Europe. Um, an IT admin came back from lunch, eager to get back to work. But instead of just a regular... Uh, desktop image that this person normally had set, all of a sudden, something else was showing, which was a bit of a disturbing message. Now, without reading all of it, this basically says, all your files have been encrypted. Visit our web service using this store link, and after payment, you'll receive a password in order to decrypt and enter your password here. Now, this piece of ransomware is called Bad Rabbit, and initially it targeted Russian Ukrainian, Turkish, and German users. But just like viruses in the real world, uh, it's very hard to contain them to uh, uh, country borders. They can just spread anywhere. Now, in this case, the way it works, because there's, there's various ways in which ransomware can uh, hit an organization, but this works by spreading a fake Adobe Flash installer that victims install themselves. And it looks something like this. So important to know is that this user who now was confronted with this ransomware message didn't install this Adobe Flash Player as you can see on the slide. And as you may notice, this is not a real Flash Player update. You can even tell by the URL, but for the untrained eye, it's fairly easy to just mistake this with something legit 
and you know we've all get the instructions make sure you run the latest software update everything so here someone was thinking they did a good job but not realizing it was actually malware that they were bringing into the organization so one of the key takeaways is there will always be a patient zero there will always be a device device that's compromised no matter how much training you throw at a user there's always someone who wants that free iPad or free iPhone and clicks the link and something funky happens. Now let's take a closer look at what happened in this case. And there's multiple ways to illustrate what happened. Um, my favorite way is to plot something on top of the MITRE attack framework. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with this framework, it's a matrix that contains a set of techniques that are used by adversaries to uh, accomplish a specific objective. Now it's um, a large framework and I just shrunk it down a little, otherwise it would be too much information on the, the slide. Um, you can see that the, let's say categories. So there's always an initial access needed. Typically there's credential theft, very likely uh, in order to spread ransomware or malware in general, you have to do lateral movement. And you also wanna make sure that you persist. So if machines are rebooted, you wanna make sure that your malware remains active. And then on the far right side, you can see there is a specific impact. Now, in this case, what happened, and we knew this already by looking at the, uh, the flash update, um, this turned out to be phishing. So the attacker posed as a legitimate source. Um, this could be, like this time it's phishing, but it could also be RDP brute force, uh, weak application settings, or many more. This is just a distilled version of the, the framework. Now, once this attacker came in using phishing, um, what happened next is that they were using a tool called Pimicats. Important thing to know is that Mimikatz is a publicly available tool. Um, you could even discuss whether this is malware or not. In my, according to my definitions, it's not. But what it allows you to do is many things, um, but it also allows you to just steal credentials. Um, and if you're lucky, you may even get a token from someone who logged on to a machine before, which allows you to elevate privileges. So imagine if someone uh, got remote assistance, or maybe the help desk, someone with more privileges, you can actually steal that token and level up. All right, so you have initial access, you manage to steal credentials. What do you do next? You wanna move lateral, you wanna move to other machines. And in this example, what the attacker did is they used PSXEC, which again is a free tool. It's not malware, it's uh, part of um, Sys internals, which has been acquired by Microsoft a couple of years ago. And it allows you to just execute on remote devices or remote Windows PCs. So that was used to spread across the network. And then afterwards, you wanna make sure that you persist. In this case, they were using scheduled tasks. And one thing to note here is nothing of this is super complex. Using scheduled tasks is just a Windows feature. PSXEC, free tool. Mimikatz, free tool. Um, you could just argue that maybe the phishing, there's some development and effort needed, but everything else is fairly simple. Now afterwards, obviously the data encryption took place and then you're confronted with the question, should you pay or not? This was already mentioned or discussed by uh, a previous presenter, um, but even if you pay, it doesn't mean that all of your troubles are over. Uh, first of all, you support the business of ransomware, which obviously is less than ideal. Um, there's always a chance of not getting the decryption keys. You don't know. Typically you, you do get them, but you're, you know, it's not a, a very, how can I say it, trustworthy person that you're negotiating with. Um, and then you also don't know if more backdoors have been installed. So even if you get the decryption key, who knows, two weeks later, uh, everything could be encrypted again. You never know. And then even if you get the decryption key, there's a lot of manual labor involved. It's not like a light switch, you turn, turn on and everything's decrypted. Typically it means there's work involved. Now not paying also introduces risk. It typically means you have to rebuild and restore um, all or part of your environment, which typically means your business cannot operate at either full capacity or half or even less. Um, and something also discussed by previous presenters uh, the attackers now decide more and more to publish sensitive information to the general public. So all of a sudden you're being extorted. Regardless of what you do, 
you have to get your security up to higher standards, which may require new hardware and software and for sure will be time consuming. Now, the previous presenter did a really good job in explaining the best practices. And I like the analogy about flying a plane, making sure that you have a cart ready with steps to take, because if stress is high, things, you know, humans tend to do silly things. So think about it in advance. And there's a lot of, let's say, run of the mill advice, right? Never click on unsafe links. Keep software up to date. Don't expose vulnerable systems to the internet. Use a good EDR system, etc. cetera. Um, there's one thing I'd like to add, because I think uh, we should pay more attention on prevention instead of detection. There's an industry trend going towards more detection, more alerts, and also more noise in which we sometimes drown. Um, but instead, I think we should add more on prevention. And that's where all of a sudden you come into my world, which is preventing lateral movement using segmentation. I'll explain what that means. If we go back in time, well, actually, maybe not so much because some companies are still organized like this. They have um, their intranet where everything's trusted and then the evil internet. Now, if one asset is compromised, this is how an attacker feels like. They can just roam around freely. They can just move lateral without any issues. As a result, what a lot of organizations did is they started to segment, which is good. It means you segment specific floors or departments or groups to kind of limit the blast radius and prevent lateral movement to a specific contained area. Um, but it's far from perfect because even though customers and organizations started to do this, we could still see ransomware still on the rise. So then came along the promise of micro segmentation and it's the holy grail. It is wrapping a firewall around every asset you have, which could be Windows, could be Linux, could be Mac, could even be OT, could be IoT. This industry started about seven, eight years ago, um, but still we see uh, it not being the industry standard. So even though it's a fantastic promise, it doesn't live up to its promises. And there's a couple of reasons why that is, and I'll recommend you, if you ever look at a micro-segmentation solution, choose something that scales. There's a couple of reasons today why those solutions or some of the solutions out there do not scale. The primary reason is that if you use a micro-segmentation solution, you still have to define this server can access that server over this port and this protocol. And before you know it, you'll be in the business of just managing network rules. You need an army of network engineers to manage and maintain and configure those. Uh, another thing to look out for is unnecessary agents. Uh, agents can introduce performance, uh, security issues or stability. Also make sure you have something you can just deploy quickly as little maintenance and also building on top of what the previous presenter said, RDP, for example, is, I even saw someone post on uh, LinkedIn, RDP, which as many of you know, stands for remote desktop protocol. Someone said, no, 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 it's ransomware deployment protocol, which again, heard it a little inside, um, but I get it. So one thing I would recommend to do, and in the postal industry, maybe this is not standard yet, but we see finance, for example, moving in towards this, uh, is making sure you have MFA on RDP or SSH or WinRM, all of these privileged protocols that IT uses, but attackers abuse as well. And try to segment as much as possible. If you do proper segmentation, this is what an attacker feels like. So they're just stuck. They will always, or there's always the option that one asset is compromised, but they can't move anywhere. If you have a good segmentation solution, you can cover up to 70% of the MITRE attack framework, which I think is good bang for your buck. Um, so definitely look into it. Just to finish, keep some couple key takeaways. Try to focus more on prevention instead of detection. Generating more alerts, getting lost in the noise is not helping anyone. Try to find the right balance because the safest computer is the one you can't use. So don't strive for perfection but initially go for good. And then afterwards you can see how you can tweak the, uh, to get closer to perfection. And like mentioned on the previous slide as well, fixing lateral movement 
you can get you up to 70% of the Mitre Tech framework, which I think is low hanging fruit. So with that, I wanna hand it back to the chairman. If anyone ever wants to reach out to me, you can find my email address here on the slide. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, if you don't mind, you could just stop sharing your screen. Um, so I think that was a really excellent um, deep dive into a particular incident and um, the potential solutions that we can deploy um, in our organizations, of course, it's resource dependent. You know, some one of the things that we have to be aware of is in the postal sector, um, there's there are limited resources available to do this kind of work. So, if we add all of the um, potential solutions together, as you said, prevention is is certainly the the, the best approach that you can take. Um, and, and there are, um, I guess, simple um, methods you could deploy. Um, as well as, I guess, as you go further up the, the value chain, it could be more complex and, and more expensive methods. But certainly um, start with the, the basics and, and ensure that you are able to, to at least create more resilience within your environment, both at a human and a technological level. I think that's important to understand as well. And I, I like the point um, of don't overtrain, that one thing, one of our presidents said don't overtrain, because that gets people um, you know, almost numb to, to the message eventually. And so you need to find a way to, to find the right balance, as Peter's saying, between you know, exactly what you need to do, um, but don't overdo it. Because for example, as you said, the safest computer is one you can't use. And who wants that really at the end of the day? So now we move on to the next part of our webinar, uh, which is where we move into sort of a talk show format. I'm going to um, just imagine, I know I have on one side, we actually do have the ability to do a talk show with, with, a, with an individual because he's right here with me, um, Misha. And we have actually on my right, we have the chair of the North Post Group who I will also um, invite to speak as he sees fit. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to ensure that all of you participate in this, this talk show. And we are going to take questions from the audience um, during, um, please post in the Q&A and then we're going to have a, a dedicated session uh, where you can ask live questions to the panelists. If you don't ask any questions, we just continue talking in talk show format. So um, please post your questions in the Q&A. And if you want to speak, um, you can indicate so in the chat and you can create a queue for you to raise your hands to speak as you go forward. Um, let's start with a very, very simple question that I think many of you have addressed thus far. Um, the way I'm going to do this is basically open it up to um, who wants to respond to this question first. Um, I'm not going to call your name unless no one answers, but um, I'm going to ask the first question. Um, can you tell me why do you think ransomware, now I guess that it's a debatable statement, is on the rise? Because uh, I know there's some data that shows a lot of peaks and troughs, but I think the general trend is up. Um, so there's some types that are going down, but some types that are going up, skewing drastically up. And as um, George said earlier, scams are on the rise full stop, which would lead to um, incur malware incursions, which could include ransomware. So why is this, um, this, this, this incident situation on the rise? What do you think is causing this? Uh, I see Matt is already um, un un unmuted, so I'm assuming Matt wants to answer first. Matt, up, over to you. Yeah, so I, th I think you're absolutely right. There was that gradual trend up in terms of the, the use of ransomware as a, as, a, as a worthwhile business model, I guess, for, for criminal groups. Last year was unique um, over the last few years because an awful lot happened geopolitically. So the, the war in Ukraine and Russia had a big impact on some of the criminal operators who who operate out of Russia and Ukraine, who have potentially been impacted by by the um, by the war there. But also, there was a lot of um, significant law enforcement intervention last year as well against certain ransomware groups and, and the criminal groups that sit behind the scenes. So, lots of things to make it, um, uh, make it very difficult for ransomware operators to to do their stuff. But one thing is absolutely clear, criminals are criminals uh, and they will continue to want to make money. 
Um, and this is a very successful business model. Now it's evolved, but we've, we've seen encryptions being the, the primary driver. But now as organizations are contain, are collecting and owning more and more digital information, so intellectual property, PII type information, vast amounts of this, that is now where that main commodity that can be monetized by criminal groups is. Uh, and this is why um, I think it was Peter that mentioned, or oh, sorry, Misha even, um, that, that move to focusing on exfiltrating data and making use of that data as opposed to encrypting the data. And that is absolutely what we're seeing um, this year. So the, 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 that massive increase in March was heavily focused around exfiltration of data as opposed to encryption of data um, by those ransomware groups. And, and I think we're going to see that through the rest of this year as well. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, John, you, you would like to say something? Yeah. I, I think, again, we, we need to sit back and realize that the threat actor is in business. And the if we apply general business practices and thought processes, ransomware has a great return on investment, right? I mean, your investment is as a, as a threat actor is really quite low. Um, you're not having to go out and buy thousands or millions of dollars worth of equipment, infrastructure, and so forth. You can go rent somebody else's stolen network infrastructure to push out your uh, your campaign. And knowing that the in, many businesses insurance will pay out a portion to all of the fee, you're really not in a negative position, right? You can do this work uh, while sitting on the beach and potentially still make tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars um, and uh, really have no worry that the, the police are gonna come knocking on your door because the likelihood is very, very small as, as was said earlier in our chat today. So if I'm a criminal, why wouldn't I wanna get into this? This is a heck of a lot easier. It's a pretty good profit making environment and uh, the chances are that if I send out a thousand uh, different uh, ransomware environments, that you know a good percentage of them are going to pay. Um, and now we're even seeing, as I think it was uh, Misha that mentioned, you know, we're seeing folks that they're not even really worrying about encrypting. They're just we're going to come in and steal your data, and and that's really where there's a huge issue, right? Look at the regulatory regime, and this is one of those things where you have to have it in your instant response plan, but look at the regulatory regime. There are certain or, uh, governments today that charge a large amount of money per individual victim if you don't do certain things related to a data breach. So let's see. I either pay the ransomware guys that have stolen my data to hopefully prevent them from leaking the data, or I may end up having to pay some regulatory fine Plus, I have a brand of tarnishment, and I have a customer confidence factor that's just been nuked and isn't there anymore. So lower effort, don't need to do the encryption, don't need to worry about that. Just break in, steal the data, and tell them I'm going to splat it out on the Internet. Um, there's a good chance that people are going to pay. And if they don't, then I could just simply sell the data to one of the other threat actor groups out there and they can leverage that data to move laterally, to find business-to-business -business relationships, compromise those from this data that I stole. Where do I sign up? Well, um, I think that's very blunt, blunt um, uh, Sorry, reality it there. Blunt, but it's, uh, exactly, yeah, it's very blunt, and it's, it's a reality position there, John. Um, George, you, you, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I'm... Uh... I noticed that John is considering a career move, but um, uh, sorry, John. Um, That's uh, I, I think we've been very naive in a general uh, sense. I mean, uh, I really think we're just at the start uh, because um, what we've seen in the e-commerce industry is, I mean, I used to work in travel and in 2002, uh, we thought, well, maybe 10, 20% of all travel will be via the internet. And now it's 99%. Um, and the same thing is happening with Prime. As, as John was already saying, it's cheap. Chances of getting caught are nearly zero. Um, and we see that law enforcement in the UK, 
less than 1% of all law enforcement officers are involved in fighting cybercrime. Well, 41% of all the crime reported is already related to, to cybercrime and fraud. So it's we're, we're really, really, really in serious uh, problems. Um, um, and maybe also a, a, a discussion with the, the other panelists. I mean, I'm a big fan of ma uh, making or paying ransom fees uh, uh, illegal. And I wondered what, what the other panelists are thinking about that. Uh, I see John already smiling, but I'm not sure, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you have time for this question. No, we, we, we have time and we're going to, I think we're going to deep dive into this going forward. So, so, so hold that thought as we say. Um, let, me, um, let, let me take the discussion a little deeper and more specific to the postal sector. Um, why is the postal sector an increasing threat? I think we've seen quite a few incidents over the last um, several months, especially uh, recently, uh, without naming any, any one particular entity. Um, but why do you think that the postal sector is an increasing threat? Any thoughts on that? If, if I may. Go ahead, Matt. So what, what we've seen in terms of the targeting of different organizations of ransomware groups over the years is historically there was focus on those organizations that had lots of money um, that were able to pay out these ransom demands and, and, and so on and so forth and focusing on the, on the data there. But as those types of organizations, and I'm sort of pointing fingers here at financial services mostly, as they've become more heavily regulated, they have put better security controls in place, they have bigger budgets, um, and there are the, the, there is more um, focus there on protecting what, what, what they have. Other types of organization, perhaps the postal sector, we're seeing it with education, we're seeing it with healthcare who haven't kept up with the times. So they are less regulated. They have less money to spend on these, these security controls. And actually they haven't done the fundamentals as well as perhaps they could or should have. And as a result, they are softer targets. And it's, it's as simple as that. Um, we're also seeing particularly around um, OT environments and manufacturing, big focus there as well, because organizations that are really susceptible to downtime are a big target for, for ransomware operators and extortion operators as well. Thank you, Matt. Um, next up, I see Peter would like to take the floor. Yeah, if I could just add one thing, um, like I definitely agree with Matt. One important aspect as well is the, the postal sector, like many uh, other industries, is just increasingly using technology in its business. And as the whole digital transformation within this sector takes place, it also increases the likelihood uh, and the interest of attackers to actually uh, go into this space. So uh, I think that's that's one of the main reasons why you'll see this increasing in the, the foreseeable future as well. Thanks, Peter. John? I'm going to defer briefly to Misha because I've already had a chance to talk and let Misha go first. And if there's still time, I'll chime in. Sure, Misha. Okay, thanks. I'll make it quick. Um, we talked about the difference between soft targets and the traditional ransomware targets like banks and financial institutions getting harder. Yes, I think that's one part. But another side of the medal is that we just see an increase in ransomware attacks across the board. And you just get your share of this increase across the board as well. So I think it's two forces at play here. Thanks, Misha. John? Just to sort of echo previously what was just said, it comes down to low hanging fruit. Um, I mean, the postal organizations are not just about delivering mail and packages, but many postal organizations also have a direct uh, uh, association with financial institutions and, and the transfer and movement and dealing with money for in the people uh, or for consumers. And so, a, it's an organization or it's a, it's, a, it's a community that's not been necessarily well thought through with regards to, uh, or I, I shouldn't say, say it that way. It's more, it's, it's a target-rich opportunistic environment where this community hasn't been hit as much as others, but it has a direct impact, right? I mean, at the end of the day, there's going to be a huge amount of pressure if a particular national level post 
is not able to deliver your packages from Amazon. Everyone is going to scream. And if you do that at the right time of the year as an attacker, you have an immense amount of pressure, political and community and public pressure to solve the problem, pay the money, get the get the systems back up and running, right? And so the threat actors know this and there's a great leverage there. So what we've got to do in the post community is really make sure that, that our game is there and we're able to help not only prevent, but also mitigate and respond accordingly um, to these. And that's going to require uh, a commitment from various posts to train their staff, have the right folks and develop the right policies and practices. Um, post is going to be a target and there's money there. There's packages there. Why would I, as a criminal, want to ignore this? So uh, we're, we're going to, I think you're going to see more potential attack towards post because there hasn't been that much there in the past and it's low hanging fruit. That's a, yeah, that's startling and, and I guess frightening, um, John. Um, I'm sorry, let me just say, they went after the healthcare industry, yeah. right? They've gone after the electrical grid. Mm -hmm. They've gone after the water supply. I mean, I can point you to uh, water utilities where the chlorine and other things have been impacted and water supply treatment facilities have been. So it's just a natural evolution. Post is next. Exactly. And um, as I said, we are seeing we are seeing the effects of that today, literally speaking. Um, we actually have a question from the postal sector. Actually, our chair, uh, Massimiliano Aschi from uh, Post Italiane, who, as you pointed out, John, actually they have a financial institution um, that they, um, they own um, in Italy. Um, he has a question specifically related to what's going on with the data. So with ransomware attacks, and when you have data that's encrypted and being made unavailable, um, and then you have the business disruption that follows thereafter. Um, the question really relates to what insights do you have as a panel as to the impact that is brought about by the stolen data exploitation itself? So not just the fact that it was stolen, but the exploitation of that data. So for example, um, that it's analyzed, exploited to gain um, some malicious benefits and then sold on black market for profit. Um, what, what, what insights do you have as to you know, the, the after effects of, our, of an incident when that data is taken and, and um, sold on the dark web and so on? Anybody wishes to take that? Matt, um, it, is it you would like to go first? Uh, your mic's and off? The, yeah, yeah. And so you, th there's a few things to, to think about here. So in, in most cases, the data is made available for free. So it doesn't need to be commoditized in that sense. So you, as it's been exfiltrated and it's made available on a leak site, it's there for anyone and everyone to get hold of. Some of these leak sites are on the dark web or the so-called dark web, um, but it's you know it's really easy to get on there and get hold of it. Some of these leak sites are on the clear net, so what, what we can normally see. So really easy to get hold of that stuff. Um, so some of that information is very sensitive it allows access into that target organization so it's really important for the organizations that are breached in that way to get on top of what is within those data sets um, but the biggest impact i get is guess is from the consumer um, or customers of um, those companies that have been targeted um, and we've seen examples of increases in fraudulent activity against the target organization making use of stolen user accounts and things like that so if it's a retailer and customer information is leaked then there's fraudulent activity that can potentially take place from there the challenge is it's really really difficult to quantify the level of impact um, because we don't always know what's been leaked we don't know what the subsequent attacks look like from uh, from the outside so it, it's really hard to quantify, but fraud is a, is a big issue and further breaches is another big issue. Thank you, Matt. John, your hand is up. I'm not sure if that's an old hand or a new hand. Nope, that's a new hand. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, okay. So again, remember, reminding that, that the threat actors today are sophisticated organizations. And in fact, there's many organizations out there whose job it is, is not actually to be victim facing, but they are 
they are other threat actor facing, right? So they are a service provider to other criminals. It's become so well organized. It's almost like, gee, it was a normal business out there, except it's the business of stealing from people and hurting people and killing people, um, depending on where and what kind of cyber threat you're looking at. Data is highly important, right? If I steal data from a postal organization and I have enough of that data, and if I, and if I may, I'll use Tracy as an example. If I have enough data of Tr Tracy and what he has shipped and mailed over the last few months, when I call somebody up on the phone or when I email them and I say, hey, look, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. I know you shipped this package to this person on this day, and I know you shipped this letter to this person on this day. So you need to trust me that I really am somebody from the organization, right? Because I have this trusted information, Tracy's guard is going to be lowered. He's going to not feel as threatened or as concerned because, well, wait a minute, that data would have only been known by the sender and the receiver of the package and the post. Now I've got his his guard down and I can leverage that to do something else, some other scam, or I can leverage that to cause an action to happen to Tracy's detriment and to my benefit as a criminal. Um, so data is about patterns as well. And the criminals out there understand this. They will leverage and use that information to figure out how to move laterally within an organization or within um, the, the whole landscape. So it's not just that they have the address or their social security number or national ID number or bank info. It's about a whole bunch of other bits and pieces that allows you to build credibility with your victim so that you can scam them. So protecting data is super important. Thank you, John. Misha. Yes, uh, one thing to add here, um, if we're thinking about personal information such as credit card information and so on that gets stolen and leaked, uh, sometimes there's a regulatory or societal pressure to then mitigate the effects of these leaks through, let's say, commercial services who are monitoring these leaks then or changing numbers if they can or protecting the affected individuals in, in some other ways. This can mean a tremendous amount of money spent. It's not uncommon that just this alone eats up the whole insurance sum by itself uh, after a successful attack. So that's, uh, I think that's one other thing to keep in mind when talking about effects of data leaks on the company as well as the individuals themselves. Yes, thank you very much. And I saw in the chat that there's a uh, um, comment about the insurance issue. Um, that's someone started a, um, a thread on that already. Thank you. Um, now, I would like to, now we have just, just have a few minutes left. So I want to ensure that we involve um, as many folks from the audience as possible. Um, I see a few hands up in the attendees list that I, I can view on my screen. And um, there are no questions written in the Q&A or in the chat that I could see. So I'm going to potentially ask, I think this is possible. Um, Nau, Nahu Kavuka to speak. Um, are you willing to speak? I'm going to allow you to talk now. now, now. No. Go ahead. You you can unmute your mic now. All right. I'm gonna. If you if you don't speak, I'm going to allow someone else. Uh, Mehmet Sekru Yaman, you would like to speak? I'm gonna allow you to speak as well. All right. And if you can't speak, you can type in the chat, Ahmed El Melef. I'm going to allow you to, to speak. Um, go ahead. You might need to unmute yourself to, to be able to speak. <laughs> 
Yes, I hope that you are seeing the asked um, messages available. It's coming up on your screen to unmute. And again, if you are um, not able to do it, I'm going to just move move through. And you can continue to post your questions in the chat if you do not see the ability to, to, to talk. Musa Thien. Go ahead. You can unmute now and you can ask your question. You need to unmute yourself to speak. All right. And I see um, I'm being reminded some people may be using the, the raise hands to just say they're, they're here and they're, they're, they're around. So that's fine. Um, and there are no questions in the chat, so I'll just continue proceeding. Just have a few minutes left, as I said, so I'm going to lower all attendees' hands. And if you do have any questions, or I see one coming up in the Q&A, Mesam, can you assist me with that Q&A question? Can you, is it a question is it to us? As I'm all, yep. There's no open questions. It was just a thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So I'm going to return to my my talk show format as we begin the wrap-up session. Um, let me lower all hands in a moment just to remove that from the, the queue. Now, um, what non-technical steps should be taken um, in terms of ransomware prevention? Um, oh, here's a bit, so before, I, before you answer my question, one of my colleagues, who I guess wanted to speak and wasn't able to speak, um, is asking, what is the importance of PRA in ransom prevent, ransomware prevention? What is the importance of PRA in ransomware prevention? And if no one understands that, maybe you can explain what PRA means. Um, is it, I think you can see it, colleagues in the chat, Musa who wants to answer, get that question answered. And there's a quest, question in French, um, a question, um, yes, I need my French, my French assistance here. Uh, une question sur le VPN. We have a question on VPN, SVP. S'il vous plaît. Microphone for the speaker, please. Ah, recovery plan. En fait, someone, uh, what's Mohammed from? Yes, is asking. He has a question on VPN, but I don't know exactly what does it mean VPN. All right, I think he's speaking, spelling it out further down below. Uh, so while you get that, um, the PRA um, clarification is recovery plan. What is the importance of a PRA, I think he probably meant DR, Disaster Recovery Plan, Disaster Recovery Plan um, in Ransomware Prevention. Anyone wants to take that? Disaster Recovery Plan. What's the importance of a Disaster Recovery Plan in Ransomware Prevention? I'll jump in there because it's sort of the, the, me being the planning hat guy, right? Um, you have to have a plan. Um, you can't be fumbling around. Time is of the essence. You need to recover and you need to you need to have thought out in advance of being attacked uh what your steps are going to be and this is where i come back to it it is critical to have that acting plan i mean i'll use my analogy of flying the airbus 350 across the atlantic you have an engine failure that's not the time to be sitting down going so what should we do should we turn the fuel on should we change fuel tanks should we try to restart do we tell anybody that I'm sorry, I don't mean to be blunt, but clearly, truly not having a plan is, is critically uh, disastrous. You need to have that plan. You need to think out what is required, what you as an organization need to do to recover from this event as quickly and as low cost and low impact as possible. And sometimes that plan might have several different paths depending on what changes during the recovery process. 
Thank you very much, John. Matt? Yeah, I was just going to add to what, what John says there, really, and echo the fact that, yes, absolutely, uh, uh, recovery plan is needed. I think what is just as valuable, though, is actually running through that plan uh, in a simulated way and actually table-topping those exercises. Um, because we, we've we've seen a couple of examples, for example, uh, where everything has been planned out and you've got this fantastic plan, but you haven't taken into consideration something. So a big part of that plan will be around how you com communicate within the organisation. Now, what if as part of that attack, your internet phones go off or are compromised and all of a sudden you lose the ability to ring someone or email someone within the organisation? You can only find those things out by testing these things. Um, so I think testing is, is crucial and it needs to be renewed, it needs to be reviewed um, and repeated. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, some really good advice from yourself and John there on, on, and responding to that question. I'm going to ask my colleague, Mesa, because um, I'm still in A1 French class, so uh, Mesa, can you help me with <laughs> no uh, problem. that question? Of course, I'm not a formal uh, interpreter, but uh, I'm happy to help. So we see a question from Mohamed Dindiaria, I think from Senegal. And he's asking, quelles sont les mesures réelles qui peuvent être appliquées pour qu'un VPN... What are the measures for a VPN to be attacked or broken through? That can be applied to prevent a VPN from being attacked or breached. I can maybe uh, take this as well. Um, or Misha, I see you have your hand up as well. I'm not, I'm not sure if you were sooner than I was. Feel free to take this one if you want. Uh, you can go ahead. I'll, I'll add some things if I feel like Okay, I'll, I'll be quick. So uh, it's a good question because we do see a lot of VPN services being uh, compromised, or at least it is a way to get in. Um, I think one of the fundamental problems that VPN has is that it's exposed as a service to the internet at all times. So uh, a lot of attackers can just brute force their way in. Um, one way to go about, uh, if we look at how VPN has evolved, VPN has benefits. You have a direct connection. It's typically speaking very performing, it's fast. If you look at where the market has gone to, um, what we see more and more is ZTNA, Zero Trust Network Access, where um, you kind of VPN through a cloud service and as a result or as a, as a benefit is that you don't have to keep that port open to the internet because you use another party that potentially does additional authentication before you granted access. That's where the market has gone to. I think as a next step where the market is going to, and this is not there yet, is where we uh, kind of go back to the, the traditional VPN method, but then we layer additional security controls on top. For example, using multi-factor authentication, where if someone tries to connect, that port is closed, but only after you have multi or confirmed your identity using multi-factor authentication, then a particular port is open for your source IP only. So to summarize my answer, traditional VPN exposed to the whole of internet, something I wouldn't recommend unless you have additional layered security controls. ZTNA is where the market is going to, in the future, I think we're going back to the older model with additional security tools laid on top of it. And then I'll hand over to Misha. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, pretty much what you said. I agree on all points there. Um, from a technical perspective, from my view, VPNs are pre actually pretty good usually. They are security devices. They're hardened. They're meant to be doing what they're doing and they're meant to be accessible more or less. Of course, you can add an additional layer of security to improve on that. But first and foremost, on a technical level, keep them up to date. Um, every once in a while, VPNs have a vulnerability. If you patch them, you get rid of those. Uh, another idea on the technical level would also be geofencing. If you are in a country somewhere in Latin America and you don't have any employees in Asia, there's no reason the whole of China needs to be able to access your VPN. That's one thing on the technical level. On the more managerial process, uh, process level, also multi-factor was mentioned. I very, very much agree on that one. Um, but also manage your accounts. If you have accounts that are not needed anymore, disable them. If people leave your company, disable their accounts. Uh, and also do not 
have shared accounts on VPNs. I mentioned this uh, thing of uh, the lapses actor buying access to companies. Shared accounts mean plausible deniability when I sell my VPN access to an actor like this, amongst other things, but this is one important thing. So do not have shared accounts, but have personalized ones that, uh, where you can have an attribution of what happens with which account if it gets compromised. Thank you. I see John's hand up, but let me let me let me do, let me do this. Um, as time has run out on us um, in terms of the the substantive part of this session, I'm going to maybe John, John, you will start. Given that your hand was up, you can lead from that in terms of closing remarks. So, in terms of our closing remarks, we basically we're trying to get feedback from all of you uh, in terms of um, what are the next steps for the posts, in particular in terms of ransomware prevention. So um, all prepare for that question, which um, is the wrap-up remarks. Give it, keep it to two minutes um, at best. And John, I will start with you, which you can also uh, probably answer, you know, jump in with your comments you wanted to make, but you can then continue with the closing remark that you would have on what POST can do going forward. Over to you, John. Great, thank you. Um, really quick, to, just to add to the VPN discussion very quickly. There is no silver bullet. There is no one technology that fixes everything. VPN is simply a wrench or a spanner in the toolbox, and you have to appropriately apply it for what you're trying to solve. In addition, you have to make sure that not all VPN service providers out there are treated equally. Some of them share data with others that you may not know about. So understand what's going on with the VPN ecosystem um, and if you're really concerned about it, build your own private VPN with your own hardware and know what's going on with it. Um, so that's just really sort of what I wanted to add on the whole VPN thing. With respects to uh, what can post organizations do, what are our sort of next steps? Um, quite honestly, the, the things that I would encourage each postal organization out there to do is to identify a person in their organization who is going to have not only the responsibility but the authority to develop and implement good sound practices within their organization for cybersecurity. Create an incident response plan. Create what your plans are. As we just mentioned a moment ago, what happens when an employee leaves the organization? whether they leave friendly or they've been terminated because uh, they did something they shouldn't have done. Um, what is your organization's process from a security and infrastructure perspective on treating those access accounts, those data, that information that they have, uh, and so forth? Um, build an incident response plan, build an IT cybersecurity plan, and have an individual that is clearly has the responsibility and the authority supported by senior management. Um, and then make use of tools. There are a lot of great open source tools. There are a lot of commercial tools. There are a lot of organizations out there uh, that will help you look at what's going on. I mean, look at some of the things that George has with the Global Anti-Scam uh, Alliance, if I got the name right, GASA. Um, look at things that, that Matt's group has at NCC and Misha and Peter have, and, and other organizations. Uh, there are tools and information and, and things out there. Uh, at Team Cymru, we have our own threat intelligence data and other information that we can provide organizations as well. So get into the community, be active. At the end of the day, cybersecurity is not a spectator sport. You cannot turn up to the football pitch and simply watch the game. It is a game that you have to participate in. You have to be down on the field, getting your hands dirty, and being involved in what's going on if you, in fact, want to protect your organization. So to the senior leaders of postal organizations, support, encourage, mentor, and nurture your staff to enable them to be able to get out there and protect the organizations they work for. That's Those are my closing comments. Thank you very much, Thank John. Um, George, one minute. 
Judge? Um, yes, I, I, I fully agree with what John was saying. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I'm Dutch, uh, so you, you need to build a dike. Um, and it's, uh, every, every measure is one stone to build, to build the wall, to, 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 to turn this tide on, on, on crime, on cybercrime. And um, uh, I, uh, very recently I spoke to the, the chief security officer, one of the largest security, cybersecurity companies in the world. And even he admitted that he was being spoofed. He thought he was getting a, a text message from his CEO to quickly arrange some gift cards for a client. Um, he bought them and the only way he discovered that he actually was being scammed was that within five seconds he got an, another request for more gift cards uh, uh, from, from, uh, uh, instead of from Amazon, from Google. Then he started thinking, well, this is not my CEO. Um, so it can happen to everybody and one of the bricks I think every company should pay attention to next to what's already being named is indeed employees. Protect your employees uh, from phishing and from scams. Thank you. Thank you, George. Matt, one minute. Yeah, so organizations can go a long way to protect themselves by getting the fundamentals right. Uh, it's fundamental. They're not basics. I, I know a lot of organizations say, do the basics well. They're not basics, they are fundamental. They need to be in place. And I've actually put, it, put, put our list in the chat, really. So employee MFA or multi-factor authentication, where possible, that goes a long way to protecting. Segregate, as to Peter's um, uh, input, segregate, segregate, segregate. Um, we need to back up stuff. So John, he's, he's hammered this point home. Back up your data, make sure you've got multiple copies, make sure that you can actually um, test that those backups are working. Patch, um, because whilst it's not one of the most easy ways in or most common routes in, um, vulnerable systems are still exploited. So, and we've seen that with, in March with the, the CLOP um, ransomware group. Invest in your people and your the, the teams and, and a, a awareness session. So to George's point, really, make sure that people have that baseline level of understanding about what the threat is and how they can protect themselves as well as the organization. And then last but not least, have that incident response plan and rehearse it. Um, and stay informed. Use threat intelligence to help inform your organization about what the threat is. It goes an awful long way. So there we go. Thank you, Matt. Misha? Um, yes, I think um, the, all the important things have been said. This is a very nice list that Matt posted. I'd just like to point out two things on that list that are actually free uh, updates. Assuming you're using properly licensed software, as you shouldn't, you most likely are, updating your software mostly comes for free. It may annoy you a little bit, it may slow you down a little bit, but it is more or less free. It doesn't cost you hard cash. And the second one, multi-factor authentication and strong passwords. Um, there's really no excuse to not use strong passwords anymore. There's no excuse to not use multi-factor authentication if it is available. Uh, and the third and last one, um, investing into people and the people's awareness. One thing that we found to be quite successful there is to not restrict that to the personal life. You can tell when, you peop when you're educating people, you can tell them, hey, this is not about your professional role only. This also applies to your private lives. It also matters if you get hacked in your private life, if your Facebook, if your Insta, if your whatever goes bust, you have a problem. What we teach you here, you can one-to-one -one port to your private life as well. Thank you, Misha and Peter. Yeah, preventing ransomware <laughs> in the uh, the postal industry or sector, it requires a multi-faceted approach, and it includes both technical as well as non-technical measures. I really like how Matt positioned this as uh, these measures as fundamental. Um, it's also very hard to add anything on top of what have, has been said already. What I can do is just close with my top eight real quick. I'll be quick. So one, keep software up to date. This includes all of your security controls, such as anti-malware software. Move away from passwords. And during the journey of moving away, use strong passwords. Um, on top of that, use multi-factor authentication wherever possible. And we even see many cybersecurity uh, insurances now demanding that you use multi-factor authentication. Uh, limit access to systems and data only to those that truly need it. Train your employees <clears throat> to recognize, <clears throat> sorry, to recognize uh, phishing. And then one point that John has uh, has talked about 
uh, very extensively is regularly take and also test your backups. And also what he talked about is develop an incident response plan. And then I'll close with my personal favorite, which is limit the blast radius for compromised assets by using micro segmentation. Little bias there, I understand, but it's definitely low hanging fruit if you have the right solution. Thank you very much to all. And I would like to wrap up with my own, um, I'll take the presenter's privilege by um, using my own um, organization's um, efforts in terms of what we're doing on the .po side. Um, so we are currently um, media objects. Okay. Right. So we are currently um, implementing a shared services platform of which cybersecurity forms a key part of our um, thrust to the, to the community that we serve. Um, in terms of cybersecurity, we have been um, very active in this space in terms of developing policies. Um, we are focused heavily on um, compliance with our domain um, security policies, um, domain validation. Um, so nobody can get a dot post domain without being verified. Uh, very big on DNS abuse and anti-abuse. Um, working with um, our colleagues in um, the InfoSec team on a cyber incident response team, um, developing skills and capacity building um, efforts within the dot post environment, and pulling that all together um, into, in our policy framework, which is available at as you can see there, info.post slash security policies. Um, we recently launched um, a domain compliance um, monitoring tool called cybertrap.post in May 2022. And for all .post um, domain holders, you are able to, to essentially use that tool to um, check compliance with uh, our DNSSEC policies, our secure email authentication policies, and our web server secure online transactions policies. There's no time to go into a demo on that today, but um, I do invite you to, to contact us and we can walk you through that tool uh, and how to use it, um, especially for those who are not, who are new to the dot post environment. Um, we've been doing cybersecurity capacity building for uh, postal operators, um, utilizing our dot post learning platform, as well as existing webinars such as this that you're seeing today. Um, our dot post learning platform is also accessed via cybertrack dot post. And um, as I mentioned, we do um, focus heavily on anti-abuse domain monitoring. We, dot post has never been abused as a domain, one of the top level domains in the world that's never been abused, which is we're very proud of that um, reputation. We tend to keep it that way. And as DNS abuse has become a huge issue going forward. So to do that, you need to register dot post domain and I don't want to get into the great details here, but simply visit us at register.post or contact us at secretariat at info.post to learn more about how to do that. Um, as I uh, wrap this up, I'm going to ask um, the director of the PTC, um, Lati Matata, to add a few remarks on this and to answer a question, actually two questions, related to what the UPU is doing um, to assist POST with this type of ransomware um, prevention activity. So over to you, Lati. Thank you very much, Tracy. And I just also want to acknowledge a very excellent contributions from the panelists. I, I have learned a lot in a very, very short time. Um, before I answer the questions, I just want to also contribute just to what to Tracy uh, said um, in terms of the dot post. So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, the PTC does have a lot of online services that it delivers to, to the postal sector. And we actually made the decision back in 2012 to put all our services under the dot post, our online services under dot post. So we have been a big supporter of dot post right from the get go. Uh, the, the second remark uh, that really struck me, and I want to repeat it, especially for, for the participants, uh, attendees, is what I think Mr. Brown said, and I'll summarize it as a trifecta of tragedy if you get attacked. The first one is, of course, uh, you lose your brand, you lose your business. The second one is then you are subject to further ransom fines. So this is further costs that you may have to incur. 
Then the third one is if there are government regulations that you have breached, then you get further fines. So this is a very, very expensive, um, let's say, tragedy for you, for all of us, if we are attacked. And it's, it seems like it is not if, it is when we are attacked. So then that builds on to uh, all the excellent advice we have been given. Um, and one thing that comes to me all the time is, who is going to pay for all this? Um, we may have open source tools, but we need to change uh, our procedures. We need to implement backup actions. This is expensive. And I can speak very authoritatively on this because um, uh, the PTC for the last five years has been going through a process of certification. So this is the ISO 277. 27001, we are certified, but only for a certain scope of our services. And we had to do a lot of work. And I have been questioned severally on why we are spending so much money on this. But I think it speaks for itself um, why we are doing this now. So to answer the questions, what can the UPU do? Um, I would say what you are being presented here now, uh, attendees, you have access to very, very um, sharp minds when it comes to advice on what you can do to improve your own internal IT networks. So again, thank you very much, panelists. You have access to the .post domain and what comes within that uh, platform. And you have access now to what I would call the overall international bureaus activities to consolidate and to bring together all the best tools. Um, to basically, we can combine all your contributions to help us all. So this model has worked very, very well because when you individually, let's say, add your experiences to, to, to the International Bureau, we then make it available for the entire community. So this sort of collaborative approach is what I'd like to strongly encourage. Uh, our chair of Dot Post is an extremely big fan, and I think we will work on him of setting up an ISAC, a UPU level ISAC, to sort of combine and consolidate all this in one place. So this is a long-term plan we hope to achieve um, to bring everything together, and I hope uh, the postal sector will, well, I'm, I'm sure, not hope, they will benefit from this work uh, in terms of cyber security protection. Thank you. Thank you very much again, all the panelists. Thank you very much, Lati. And there's nothing left for me to say except to say thank you to all the panelists, Misha, Matt, John, George, and Peter, and all of you who participated. And now I'll hand back over to the chair of the assembly, uh, Massimiliano, to give us final remarks and to close us off. Thank you. Thank you very much also from my side to all the panelists. Uh, the the session was really highly high entertaining and <laughs> there were very interesting discussions uh, that arose uh, and I've been particularly impressed by the, the figures that were presented uh, but also um, this initiative uh, is a, a concrete demonstration uh, on how we could contribute in uh, raising awareness uh, on uh, a phenomena which is spreading uh, all over our business, uh, also our business. Also, we had some uh, measures that we could adopt no? uh, to, to counter this phenomena. And uh, we, we know that also dot post can play an important role uh, in supporting our uh, design operators uh, to counter this threat effectively uh, in, uh, in a very short time, because we, we don't have enough time to wait, in my opinion. Uh, the, the threat is... Uh, is very important. So thank you again. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for the, the great work for you, you for in arranging this uh, webinar. I think that this uh, concludes our 15, uh, 15th uh, General Assembly. I would like to thank again the entire secretariat, the interpreters uh, and the technicians, and all of you for, the, for your contributions today and the meeting is now closed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks to all. Do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, interpreters, from my end as Thank well. You. Appreciate it. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye, all.
Bye, everyone. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.